Why does the slowing of the bile acids occur? We don't know. people welcome back to my channel my name is Elizabeth also known as nurse Sabe here on YouTube Instagram TikTok, and I am a labor and delivery nurse a postpartum nurse certified childbirth educator and mom to three and today I am coming at you guys with one of my favorite things a super educational video and we are gonna be talking all about cholestasis of pregnancy also known as intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy also known as obstetrical cholestasis so if you have been diagnosed with this, if you have heard about this, if you've had a friend or family member, this video is for you. It also can just be a great educational tool as you're heading into your pregnancy, knowing what things you need to be worried about and you need to be watching out for, for this rather common diagnosis that we see within pregnancy. So let's go ahead and jump into it. When we're talking about cholestasis, the first thing that I want to discuss a little bit is kind of the function of the liver and the gallbladder, because these are the two organs that are working together here, and we're having a little bit of a disconnect that's causing our symptoms related to the buildup of bile salts and bile acids. Your liver actually has a lot of jobs in your body, but specifically today when we're talking about cholestasis, I want to talk about bile acids. Now, your bile acids are something that are produced by your liver and they contain mostly bile salts, water, electrolytes, some other stuff. And the purpose of this bile is to help break down fats. It is also then to help your body absorb that fat and to absorb fat soluble vitamins. Keep that in mind because that is pretty important. Now your liver produces this bile, it goes through a series of ducts, it's stored in your gallbladder and then your gallbladder will contract and like kind of shoot out the bile. Now when we have the cholestasis, the intrahepatic, hepatic meaning liver, cholestasis of pregnancy, what we're seeing is a slowing of those bile salts exiting the liver. They're kind of getting held up in that liver gallbladder area. And when that happens, instead of the bile salts really being able to do their job to break down the fat, they get released into the bloodstream. And this release of bile salts into your bloodstream causes the number one symptom of cholestasis of pregnancy. Intense and severe itching that is often localized to the hands and to the soles of your feet. This itching does not come with a rash because there are some rashes associated with pregnancy, but this itching often can cause some breakdown of skin because you are scratching so freaking violently because you are so stinking itchy. So cholestasis is actually the most common pregnancy specific liver disorder that we see. It occurs in approximately one per 1,000 pregnancies. Most often it's seen occurring in the third trimester, but it can occur before that. So let's talk a little bit about why we have cholestasis. Why does the slowing of the bile acids occur? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know specifically. We do believe that it is heavily influenced by hormones, estrogen and progesterone being the two hormones that we see have an influence because those do increase in your third trimester and your third trimester is when we are most likely to see it. We understand that there's probably a hereditary component. You're more likely to have cholestasis if you have a direct relative, so a mother or a sister who has had it in the past. We also know that having multiple pregnancies puts you at an increased risk. Now, is this due to the weight of the pregnancy or the extra hormones that we have going on? We're not 100% sure, but we know that when we have pregnancies that have been initiated through IVF and there are some more intense hormones occurring with that because you're getting them externally, there is a higher risk of developing cholestasis. So some other risk factors include being over the age of 35 years old and also geographical location. So there might be some connection to having a low amount of selenium in the diet. So we see it more commonly in people who are from South America or Northern Europe. We also see if you've had previous liver issues in the past. So if you've had hepatitis C, if you've had gallstones, if you've had any sort of liver disorder previously, you are at an increased risk for developing cholestasis in your pregnancy. Now, what we are also seeing is in individuals with cholestasis, there is an increased risk of having concurrent gallstones, of having extreme nausea and vomiting early in pregnancy, 
of having preeclampsia, and of having gestational diabetes. All of these things seem to be connected, and we're not 100% sure where the connection is coming from, but it kind of makes sense that your liver is just going bajiggity. What are the symptoms of cholestasis? So we already talked about the itching on the hands and the feet. This is known as puritis, and it's often our first symptom, and this might be a symptom that we notice before we see any changes in laboratory results. So just because you have negative laboratory results initially, if that itching of your hands and feet continues with no rash, we want to continue to follow up to see if cholestasis is slowly developing. Basically, sometimes you get the symptoms before we see lab changes. So with this itching, we see that it often progresses progresses and gets more severe as the pregnancy continues and also that it is the most severe at night when you're trying to sleep, which is fabulous because it's already impossible to sleep when you're pregnant. So some other symptoms that we might see are malaise or feeling really, really tired, right upper quadrant pain, which often appears associated with liver pain, dark urine, pale stools, steatorrhea, or your stools seeming really, really oily. Sometimes people even will appear jaundiced. That, that happens in about 10 to 15% of pregnancies that are complicated by cholestasis. Nausea and vomiting might also be a symptom that we see. When we are presenting to our provider with itchy hands and itchy feet, the first thing that they're gonna do is draw a total serum bile acids level. And this is going to be one of the first ways that we can see, hey, are our bile acids in our blood elevated to a level where they should not be? These might not always show a change initially, and so if you persistently have symptoms of cholestasis, we wanna to continue to redraw these every one to two weeks or so, just to make sure that we are continuing to follow up that those lab results don't change. We're also gonna look at your liver function, so your AST and your ALT are things that we can examine. Those sometimes might be elevated, they also can be normal. Another thing that we might do is do imaging of the liver and see, hey, what's going on there. About 13% of people who present with cholestasis will have concurrent gallstones that we might see on imaging or imaging might look completely normal. Now because vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin and we know that we need enough bile to kind of help break this down and absorb that fat soluble vitamin, one other thing that we are definitely going to be screening for is to make sure that your coagulations or your ability to clot your blood is normal because if you're not absorbing that vitamin K as you should be, those levels can decrease and put us at a risk for hemorrhage in the postpartum period. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about what is cholestasis, how we diagnose cholestasis, let's talk about why we care about cholestasis because yes, having itchy hands and feet is extra super annoying, but there can also be some negative effects to your baby. With intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, we can see an increased risk of preterm birth, an increased risk of meconium and meconium aspiration in your baby, and an increased risk, rarely, of a stillborn baby. We also know that with cholestasis, we do have an increased risk of preeclampsia and gestational diabetes as well. When we aren't able to actively manage cholestasis, the risk of preterm birth is as high as 20 to 40%. The increased incident of preterm birth is thought to be associated with the increased bile acids in the blood, making your body more receptive to oxytocin. Because of the increased bile acids in your blood, it creates increased colonic activity of your infant, which can lead to an increase in passing their first stool before birth. And when babies pass their first stool before birth, this is called meconium stain fluid. And rarely, meconium stain fluid can be aspirated into the lungs and create a pretty significant infection in baby. We also sometimes see a respiratory distress syndrome in infants who have been exposed to increased bile acids in the maternal blood flow, and this is thought to be due to that increased bile acids putting strain on the lung and reducing the amount of surfactant that baby is producing, and surfactant is what allows those lungs to open up so nicely. We also sometimes will see fetal distress in the form of arrhythmias, tachycardia, and bradycardia. So stillbirth is a very rare complication of cholestasis, but one obviously that we take very seriously. The exact mechanism is unknown, but they think that it might be a result of the arrhythmias related to the bile acids or vasospasms in the placenta related to the increase in bile acids in the blood flow. So all this to say, this is why we want to have a diagnosis of cholestasis. If you're feeling itchy in your hands and feet, we want you to go to your provider so that we can see what's going on so that we can properly treat you with some medications to help with itching and to help with those bile acids. And then we can think about 
getting baby out a little bit on the earlier side to decrease that risk of the meconium aspiration, the respiratory distress, the arrhythmias, and the possibility of stillbirth. So your deoxycholic acid, that's a mouthful, I'm gonna leave it up on the screen because who knows if I even pronounced that right, is going to be our main medication to help treat cholestasis of pregnancy. This is going to help bring down the bile acids in your blood. And so what we do is we start off with a pretty normal dose and we can increase as needed to help bring those bile acid levels down to a more appropriate level. Then the other thing that we wanna manage for is your discomfort. So a topical cream like a corticosteroid might help with that itching, as well as cold baths or showers can also help with the itching. If your vitamin K levels are low, supplementing with vitamin K is also going to be something that can be really beneficial or helpful to you. We are going to watch your baby very, very closely with the diagnosis of cholestasis until we get to an appropriate time for an early induction. And so what we're going to do is do weekly or bi-weekly NSTs, which we basically hook you up to external fetal monitoring and look at your baby's heart rate. We look for good variability and accelerations that tell us that the baby is doing really well in that moment and is well oxygenated in that moment and is good predictor for babies continuing to do well and continuing with the pregnancy. We also are going to continue to do regular blood tests and look at your bile acids, look at your liver function, and just make sure that that is continuing to maintain get better with medication or if it's getting worse, we might need to intervene a little bit earlier. So an early induction between 36 and 39 weeks is recommended for people suffering with cholestasis of pregnancy because of that increased risk of complications to the newborn that we have previously discussed. And when you're talking with your healthcare provider, they're going to be looking at your laboratory work and your symptoms to decide what is the best time in that time frame for an early induction for you. Typically it happens around 37 weeks for most people. If the plan is for you to deliver your baby before 37 weeks, there also might be a discussion of giving betamethasone, which is an injection that would go in your buttocks or your thigh. It is a steroid that can help with lung maturity for your baby. After your delivery, the symptoms of cholestasis should resolve within 48 hours after delivery, which is amazing. But unfortunately, it does have a really high recurrence rate, up to 90% for subsequent pregnancies, which is not super fun. Another complication that we see sometimes is if you were to go on hormonal birth control, you would actually have the symptoms of cholestasis again because hormonal birth control contains that estrogen and progesterone. It can kind of trick your body into thinking, oh, let me do this thing again, when really, we don't want to be doing that. During your pregnancy and also after, because there is that increased risk for gallstones that can be related to cholestasis, you might have a recurrence of gallstones and have the need to get your gallbladder removed. Okay, so I hope that this video was helpful in explaining to you what is going on with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, obstetrical cholestasis. It's kind of confusing. It's kind of a lot of different things all going together in one, but when we look at the big picture, we wanna make sure that we are treating the symptoms, monitoring the bile acids, and kind of going from there. And then making sure that we get baby here in a safe and healthy way. So considering an early induction based on your symptoms and your lab results. I hope that was helpful. Definitely let me know if you've learned anything about cholestasis of pregnancy. I certainly learned quite a bit researching for this. And until next time, bye guys.